what's his name. Hi, thank you for the applause. I'm Robert McBride, and welcome to the first pre-concert conversation of this new season of Oregon Symphony Concerts. Glad you're here. This is being videotaped tonight, as the Saturday night conversations always are. So please tell your friends that they can watch that and get some insight into tonight's program. And we'll get a lot of insight because we have the conductor here, June Merkel. Welcome back. Thank you. It's great to have you here again. And a very talented young composer named Catherine Balch. And we have an unusual situation. This is the first time in the history of the Oregon Symphony when they've commissioned a new piece and the first performance is not conducted by the music director of the orchestra at the time. Carlos is off conducting somewhere else. I don't happen to know where that is. And I had... Sorry? He's in Australia. Oh. So he thinks it's springtime. And he's right. So, I'm very happy to say that Catherine Balch will be participating in these conversations tonight and tomorrow night, and tomorrow afternoon rather, but not Monday. Right, okay, so we gotta get as much out of you as we can. How did the Oregon Symphony know about you? How did they commission this piece? Um, I, uh, I, I am with, I'm on the management roster of con uh, young concert artists. Um, and I know the Oregon Symphony might, um, has commissioned music by Chris Rogerson. You might have heard some of his work. He's also on the roster with me, so I'm sure the connection came through, came through young concert artists um, and that affiliation with the Oregon Symphony. And young concert artists, an organization in New York City that helps people like you. So when did this happen? When did they contact you? Um, so... This commission has been sort of in the works for about a year now um, and didn't really become solidified until uh, whenever June, I know I sent you some scores. Um, it's, sometimes it's hard squeezing in a date for a new work because um, conductors are scared of new music. <laughs> um, as you can see, I'm very scary. Um, <laughs> So, so I think I think it took some time to find find a place that that sort of accommodated everyone in the ensemble, including the conductor. And, and June's been so generous with his time and his expertise, um, really seriously getting to know my music and bringing it to life tonight. So I'm very grateful to that. So June, is that true that conductors are afraid of new music? Uh, yes and no. But um, let's see. We have. In our business, we have those conductors who are the specialist for contemporary music. They're just doing this thing and they know everything about it. Maybe not about the rest of the repertoire, but um, I'm not this kind of specialist. So what I need to know is um, what kind of music this composer will write and can I find some access to this music? And so I was careful enough to ask first for some scores for, of previous works Catherine has written. And um, I looked carefully through these works and then I said, yes, I can find an access. I do understand at least part of what she is writing and the rest I will have to work out uh, during the process on studying the new piece. And then I said, yes, great, I love it and I would love to do this commissioned work, and that's why we put it then on this program. Yay. Great, I'm so glad. Catherine, I went to your website today to listen to some of your music and to learn a little bit about you, and I noticed that the background on the website is handwritten music. Is that how you work? I do, I do work by hand. Um, Not I, using a computer, but actual pencil and paper. Yeah, I, I like the tactile experience of composing. I'm a, a very physical person artistically, so I like to be playing instruments, I like to be vocalizing, I like to be experimenting with every sound I write, and I also really like the tactile experience of, of writing by hand. Um, so that's a really important part of my process, and, and um, my friends 
always hear me complain about the stage in the process when you do, in fact, have to put it into the computer because you, you can't give um, an ensemble your, your scrap paper and ask them to put it together. So, <laughs> so there, there is always that excruciating part in the process where it does end up in um, a sort of notation software program, yeah. Supposedly, when Arnold Schoenberg was teaching composition in Los Angeles, he would hold up a pencil and, and tell the students they should note that it had two ends with two different functions, and the eraser was the more important of those two functions. A couple of years ago, I saw a documentary about the Estonian composer Arvo Pärt, and the first time we see him at work composing, he's erasing something. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, one of the nice things about working with um, um, a pencil and paper is you do at least have a record of everything you've written. So even if you throw out a lot of material, which I do, it's always nice to have that sort of tangible record of my work. So even if I feel like I'm starting a piece from scratch or things aren't going well creatively, I can look back at all this work I've done and go, well, I do have a tangible product here. There must be something in here that's, that's worth keeping. So I think that's another satisfying part of of the handwritten process is, is getting to see your work and spread it out and get a sense of... of oh, that's your, right. You can spread it out over the whole table. You can't do that on a computer Or sometimes over the whole apartment. <laughs> More than one table. So, June, you've worked with other living composers, I assume, right? Do you enjoy it? I, I would think it would be really fun and stimulating. Yeah, um, just a word for this. Um, it's a tendency uh, among composers nowadays um, to work only with a computer and then they have a lot of this copy and paste thing and it does sound like this. <laughs> it's copy and paste and very often um, I think the direct access with the pencil and the eraser, not the delete button, um, makes a difference and I mean to delete something uh, is a dramatic act Yes, you put so much energy and thoughts and sleepless nights into this passage, and then you take the paper and... <coughs> yes, that's a dramatic act. <laughs> and uh, so I love this process. In this um, aspect, I'm pretty old-fashioned. And uh, I think that you can hear in this piece, it's very well written for my side, looking as a musician, as a performance performer onto that music. It all makes sense. It's not easy to play, but it's well thought out and has this connection to musicians, to the instruments. And uh, so we appreciate very much the work, how it's written and how it sounds. And it's called chamber music. I mean, it isn't literally an ensemble for seven players or something. It's a full orchestra. Why did you call it chamber music? Um, I called the piece chamber music um, because I, I love uh, experiencing chamber music. I, I love being in a room with my friends making music, either sight reading or listening to them sight read, and um, experiencing music in an intimate space. And when you're in that space, of course you're not just hearing the music, you're hearing the ambience of the whole room. So you're hearing people's chairs creak, sometimes people are whispering to each other or talking to each other, sometimes there's a bug flying around the room. Um, and so I was interested in this piece trying to capture the whole ambience of a room uh, with the orchestra. So what you'll hear is sort of a core group of instruments playing pitched material, um, like a dyad, just da dum ba dum ba dum ba dum um, And then you'll hear another group of instruments kind of recreating the ambience of the room. So litter, little unpitched sounds, chirps and squeaks and scratches. Um, and th they're, sort of, they're sort of creating what to me is the whole intimate experience of, of listening to music in a, in a small space. And of course, the, the sort of irony of that, letting the space is not small. Um, but I, but I, I hope to recreate some of that intimacy here tonight, so. I would think the members of the orchestra would really enjoy that. Have they told you so? Yeah, I think, I think um, I've gotten wonderful. The Oregon Symphony is an amazingly collegial group of people, um, if you don't already know that. Um, it's a community of artists that is happy to, to come and play every day, and everyone's been so supportive and kind. Um, I think 
asking musicians to maybe do something that that is n non-conventional or maybe unstandard is always um, uh, uh, something you you ask from a place of graciousness and 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 trust that 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 you respect that that person has dedicated their time to this instrument and you're not asking them to do anything that is is damaging or out of place for them technically or that is that makes them feel like they like they don't belong in the overall musical texture so does that make sense <laughs> The, this orchestra is very open-minded and they try to try out new things, new techniques. I had nobody complaining about anything. They were really very hard at trying and succeeding. And I think this freshness of um, being curious to discover new things, that's one of the great qualities of this orchestra and helps very much for situations like this when they're faced with new music. June Merkel, you grew up in the perfect family to become a professional musician. Your dad was a violinist and your, and your mother a pianist. Did you ever do any composing? Did you ever do any composing? Um, no, I did never compose, but I learned those instruments, violin and uh, piano, from well, when I was four I started the violin, and five I started the piano and played them yeah, throughout my life until now. Um, the great thing is now I have these wonderful musicians playing the violin for me, so I don't do that anymore, but uh, still play the piano. And do you play with friends? Do you chamber music, sight reading? Yes, of course. Oh, good. Yes, yes. That's a part of the fun. So you two are very much alike in that way. I like that. So Catherine, in, in what sort of family did you grow up in? Were they musical? Uh, my parents were both musical when they were younger. Um, they're, they're both research scientists. Um, and my brother is, it just started his surgery residency. Um, so, I, I wouldn't say I grew up in a particularly musical family. I have to be careful because they're back there right now. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but certainly, creativity and the arts were something that was always very much encouraged in my household. And I think there's very much a kinship between the sciences and the musical arts in particular. Um, a way of thinking um, and sort of a combination of, 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 of technical rigor and sort of creative uh, cr creative uh, dialogue of ideas that, that is very similar in music. What both of you do professionally involves your entire brain in multiple ways. It's, it's physical, it's intellectual, it's emotional, it's creative, and there can't be anything better for brain exercise. In fact, Renee Fleming sang here with the Oregon Symphony to start the season. And when she was in town, she also participated in a panel on brains and music. And it's well known that our brains just light up all over the place when we listen or perform. Yes, the brain, it's very much a brain thing, but um, I would like to point out one basic difference between a composer and us on our side, the performers, because um, from our side, when we look at the music, we have our parts, I have the score, and this is the Bible. You don't change anything. You kind of martyr your brain and uh, to figure out what is it what the composer wanted to say. And then you find these places which are different and you can't make sense out of it. You have sleepless nights and so. And then I go to the composer and ask his, I really tried so hard, can you help me to understand your writing? And then the composer says, oh, this is not good, I change it, whoop. Uh, <laughs> and you see, the way of um, perception is very different. She is the creative part, blank, now we know, paper, not computer, paper. And um, nothing is on it and she has to create something new. And we take this information and recreate or try to find uh, 
dive in the world, how we can read it from the score and try to translate it in sound for you. So um, I was very often asked, are you also composing? And I do not, because I cannot kind of combine these two sides. I'm serving the music, I'm serving the composition and the composer. I'm an advocate for the composer and I read and try to translate. And you have to be free from this. You have to just kind of have your blank paper and create a new world. And that's what I find so fascinating. Yes, though, though I think it's certainly the, 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 sorry, the feeling of newness, especially when you're faced with, with just staff lines, it feels that way, but nothing's really new. Um, I am in a dialogue with the composers and the music I love. Um, my identity and my musical identity is shaped by every single one of my experiences, musical or not. So nothing that ends up coming out is 100% new. In fact, it's, it's actually this um, wonderful, very personalized or subjective coloration of a whole bunch of things that already exist in this world. And I think that's what I'm trying to do when I compose is to sort of express my subjective experience of the things that I love. You know, we'll come right back to that at the very end of the concert, the last movement of the Brahms Symphony Number no. 4 being a Pasakalia, a form that Bach and his contemporaries used all the time. Nobody was writing Pasakalias when Brahms was writing music, but he was very respectful and of the past and interested in it and wrote this magnificent set of variations, which we'll hear later tonight. Okay, Catherine, favorite composers, go. Oh, um, living or not living? Um, the, the composers from sort of the, the canon that I, I love, um, definitely Beethoven, um, probably my number one guy. Um, I love Georgi Ligeti, yes. uh, very much. In fact, this piece is very much a response to Ligeti's Clocks and Clouds, which is a piece for, for ensemble and choir. Um, I love, love Schubert very, very much. Um, I'm pretty sure some of Schubert's late piano sonatas were written for me. <laughs> it's very nice of him. I don't know how he knew. Um, I very much love the Italian composer Salvatore Chirino. Um, he, he lives in Umbria. Um, I very much love the American composers Charles Ives, Pauline Oliveros, Kati Agos, who was my teacher, um, Ashley Fury, Kate Soper. There's so many, there's so much amazing music being written right now. Um, and outside of concert music, I, I was just talking actually with Monica um, today. Uh, um, I, I love Chris Thiele and I love um, a lot of Appalachian trad and folk music. Um, so I, yeah, I guess that's a taste I could go on forever. Yeah. So, June Merkel, favorite composers, go. Yes, it's difficult to say because we have, even on this program, we have four, and I can't say who is my favorite composer because um, the others would be angry with me, the composers. So, um, I'm very practical. The next piece, the next composer I'm performing, that's my favorite one. And I switch four times at this concert. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's kind of what they all say. It's the one I'm working on now. How long is chamber music? Uh, it's about 11, 11 minutes. Okay, what's the longest piece you've written so far? Um, I, I wrote a chamber opera when I was an undergraduate that's about 45 minutes. It's very silly. It's very absurd. Um, and and um, I guess probably... Probably that's the longest piece. Yeah. What do you want to do that you haven't done yet? You've written chamber music. I, I assume you've written some choral pieces. I think the thing that I, I want to do is, is really just work with my friends. Um, I think some of the most rewarding, and I am doing, I'm very lucky to be doing that, I think some of the most rewarding musical experiences are close collaborations. Mm. So um, one collaboration I'm very much looking forward to is I'm writing a violin concerto right now for my best friend, Robin Bollinger, who's a fantastic young violinist. 
Um, and I think those are always the projects I get the most excited about, are projects when I, I know I can be directly in touch with the musician I'm writing the piece for and, and really make it for them. Do you have your own ensemble, since you love to play so much? Oh, oh gosh, I don't love to play publicly. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but certainly, um, I, I write music for my friends all the time. Last year, my roommate uh, and I live with a dog and a cat, and he's a singer. And so last year, I wrote him a cycle called Die Haustier Liederbuch, which means the song cycle basically um, so he wrote the poems and they're about our cat and our dog and and I wrote the music and that was a very fun piece <laughs> that sounds a little on the silly side too yeah well Ligeti wrote some very silly weird things and, and some very very serious things too it occurred to me Catherine that you are about the same age now as Aaron Copeland was when he wrote the piano concerto that we'll hear you know on Bartanon play tonight which was so we're Roaring Twenties, it was written just a couple of years after Rhapsody in Blue. Sounds to me like Copeland's response to Rhapsody in Blue. And there are also some things in it that I think inspired Bernstein later in some of his swankier music. If you live to a ripe old age and keep writing music, and I certainly hope both of those will happen, do you think your, you don't know, but do you think your music will go through the kinds of radical changes that Copeland's did? Um, I sure hope so. I certainly hope to not be writing the music in 10 years that I'm writing now. Absolutely. And, and I think you'll hear in the Copeland um, a very different side of him than maybe Appalachian Spring, which is very much, I think, a response to Gershwin um, and that music. Um, and, and also much, much thornier in some ways and rhythmically, rhythmically, sort of it has this rhythmic vitality to it that is very energizing and fast-paced. Yeah. June, what do you think about this Copeland Concerto? Let me ask, has anybody ever heard Aaron Copeland's Piano Concerto in concert? Look at all those hands, like none. I never have either. So nobody plays this piece, and it's by one of the most famous American composers. What's the deal? Um, for the pianist, is, um, is a special thing, because first of all, you need to have the feeling for it. Uh, this is an American feeling, this is the swing, and many pianists don't have it. Second, um, you're not always the soloist. You're playing a lot of stuff with the orchestra, and we say it's doubled. Who is doubling whom? Yes, the winds are doubling the piano, or the piano is doubling the winds, um, but there is a very nice dialogue always. And um, it's different from, let's say, um, Beethoven piano concerto. There is very clear that's the soloist and we accompanying him or her. And in this case, this piece is different. It's a jam session, <laughs> yes. And um, also, it's, it's pretty radical. Radical in a way that Copland had his idea of redefining or defining what is American style music that didn't exist before. Is before we had, um, yeah, on this continent you would play European music and you would try those composers here on the continent, you would try to imitate. They would go to Europe, study there in Paris, in Vienna, in Berlin, and f s learn this musical language from these composers there and bring it here. And I think this country is so different from Europe, so you have to f find your own identity. And that's with, uh, what Copland was trying, and he was actually, I think, the first one and he made a very wise decision because he was saying, what's typical about us, um, what's unspoiled, and what do you, do you do not find anywhere else? That's the jazz, that's the ragtime, that's Gershwin, that's Scott Joplin and all these uh, wonderful guys. Um, 
But most composers would shy back and don't regard that as serious enough music to be performed in a classical concert hall. And that's also the thing in Europe. We had this classical music which originated um, from the courts. And then later the wealthy citizens who had a lot of money would support an orchestra very expensive thing, yes, an orchestra and bigger ensembles to perform for the king for their pleasure. And then on the other side, they had this music purely for entertainment, for people in the streets, dancing music. And we really make still um, this separation in Europe of serious music and entertainment music. And this didn't exist here in this country, this separation. And Copland profited from that. He said, this is what I take, and I transform this into American-style music. And I think he really succeeded, because what he did was he took this music and this swing in the music, the harmonies, the way these guys were writing, for piano and for orchestra, and he combined this with really sophisticated composing techniques which were taken out of the so-called classical music traditions. So he raised the level of sophistication, um, and because at that time a piece of this length in this genre of jazz music didn't exist. So he took that and uh, made kind of a combination and you will be excited. There's a lot of swing and very difficult for the piano, also for us rhythmically, but uh, you can't find anywhere on any other continent this kind of music and it's really a great pleasure. And we have a wonderful soloist, uh, Inon Bar Barnatan, he is um, playing this piece amazingly. I'm sure you will like it. This is an amazing concert with the very first performance of a new piece by Catherine Balch, commissioned by the Oregon Symphony. Yay. A symphony by Haydn. We haven't talked about that. We don't have time tonight. It's a symphony known as the Hen because it's got some clucky stuff in the first moon. It's really cute. You know how Haydn can be. He's pretty funny. Uh, the principal oboe gets to do this fun thing. And the amazing Copeland piano concerto we never get to hear and then Brahms for to wrap it all up, and we get to enjoy it. Thank you for being here. You've made a very good choice. Catherine Balch, June Miracle. Thank you.